Hey everybody, we are this week moving from prehistory into the era of civilization. So we're going to be surveying a number of different civilizations this week, starting with Mesopotamia, then Egypt, then various civilizations in the Aegean Sea region. Now, I want to address an issue that affects the entire humanities program and, and one that um, I think is worth addressing from the beginning. The question is, why are we starting in these particular places? In other words, why are we starting in Mesopotamia and Egypt when in fact, right around the same time, let's say 3000 BC, there are advanced civilizations beginning to take shape in places like India and China. Uh, and we're not gonna be talking about those places. So why is that exactly? Why is this course, not just Humanities 101, but, but subsequent Humanities courses, why are they all focused on the West? Um, now, I'm sure you've all heard people use this language, right, of the West with a capital W or Western culture. Uh, what does that mean exactly? It's hard to define it with precision, but basically we're talking about, when we talk about Western culture, we're talking about the culture that arises, that this sort of takes shape in, um, medieval and modern Europe, and then is exported to various places like the Americas through things like colonization. Um, so um, that's gonna be our focus in this course, and that is going to kind of determine what we pay attention to and what we don't really pay so much attention to. Now, I wanna be clear that this is not a value judgment. We are not focusing on Western culture because we believe that Western culture is somehow superior to all others. Uh, so it's not, not a value judgment in that sense. So why are we doing it? Well, we're doing it because uh, really for all of us, I mean, if you're in, living in the year 2021 and you're taking a course in the United States of America, no matter your, um, your religion, no matter your place of birth, your ethnicity, your race, um, you are participating in Western culture. It is just the air that we breathe today. And one of the major goals of the whole humanities program is to help us to understand how did we get to be the way we are? How did Western culture actually take shape? so many practices and behaviors and assumptions and beliefs that we kind of take for granted had to be uh, kind of invented and then established in Western culture. And so part of what this course is doing is seeing how that happens. Um, you know, let's just take something that's very seems very obvious to those of us who are Americans, uh, this idea that a country ought to have a written constitution, right? We never debate about that in this country. Should we write down our constitution or not? No, we, we take that for granted. Um, but um, that is a relatively recent historical phenomenon, this idea of having a written constitution. Um, so, um, so that's the kind of thing that we're interested in this class. Now, all that being said, especially my point about Western culture being very closely identified with modern European culture, why are we starting in this course in places like, well, Mesopotamia, which is in Asia, or Egypt, which is in Africa? Um, we're starting in these places because in these places, we find the deep roots of Western culture. Western culture as we know it today would be different, perhaps dramatically different, without the influence of these ancient African and um, Asian 
cultures. So there's of course an irony here, right? Which is that the deep roots of Western culture are actually in the East or in the South, depending on how you look at it. And so it's just a reminder that uh, this, this term Western, um, you know, we're kind of stuck with it and it has a certain use, certain utility, but it's, it's not totally adequate. It's, it's a, a term that um, uh, has some real limitations. So we'll use it in this class, but we need to be aware of that. So here's the main point. Uh, all the different cultures we're going to be studying in the initial weeks of this course, we're studying them precisely because they leave a permanent imprint on Western culture as we know it today, right? They contribute to the DNA of Western culture. And that's why we're studying these cultures. Again, uh, we're not... Uh, this is not a, a cheerleading exercise. Uh, we're not saying that everything about Western culture is great, um, but uh, we're trying to understand where it came from. All right, so in this talk today, I'm gonna be focusing on Mesopotamia. Uh, and let me go ahead and share a PowerPoint so we can look at a map of Mesopotamia so that we're all very clear on where exactly Mesopotamia is. All right. So there's a map of Mesopotamia and um, Mesopotamia is basically that, um, well, I mean, let's look at the word itself. Mesopotamia means in Greek, um, sort of between the rivers. And the rivers in question are those that are sort of highlighted on that map. Uh, the Euphrates to the west and the Tigris to the east. Um, so this is part of that larger area known as the Fertile Crescent. Okay. So Mesopotamia stretches all the way from um, really, you know, Assyria in the north down to Sumer in the south near the Persian Gulf. Now, Mesopotamia is not the name of a nation. It's not the, the name of an empire. It is simply a geographical designation, okay? There's never been a country called Mesopotamia. But if you're wondering what modern day country more or less corresponds with Mesopotamia, it is the country of Iraq. And you know, if bells are already ringing, like when I mentioned the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers, if that already seems kind of familiar, um, that's probably because you've been to Sunday school and or you've read Genesis, and you know that a lot of uh, the early action in the book of Genesis takes place in Mesopotamia. All right, well, you're reading uh, this week, you're reading in West in the World on Mesopotamia, basically covers the period from about 3500 BCE to about 500 BCE. Incidentally, we're not going to get into the common era until unit three of this class. So it's really gonna be a while till we get there. Um, so your reading is basically concerned with the unfolding of civilization in Mesopotamia during that time period. And I think it's worth spending a little bit of time talking about that word civilization. I think sometimes we just conflate it with the word culture, but civilization means something fairly specific. It comes from the Latin word uh, civis, this, that's C-I-V-I-S. And um, a, a civis, it, where we get our word citizen, is simply the Latin word for a city dweller, okay? So a civilization is something, you don't, you don't have a civilization until you have cities. Okay. So quite literally, to be civilized is to be citified. Now, 
you know, the, the rise of cities is in many ways just a kind of outgrowth, a kind of uh, develop, further development of these uh, Neolithic villages of, you know, maybe a couple of thousand people that you read about last week. Uh, I think it's safe to say, just to be conservative, it's safe to say that we can't really talk about cities until we're talking about uh, communities of, of at least 10,000 people or so. And some of the very first cities in the world that we know anything about arose in Mesopotamia. Um, if you look down at that map again, around Sumer near the Persian Gulf, you'll see cities like Ur and Uruk. These are some of the earliest cities in human history. Uh, Uruk might in fact be the first city in human history, certainly um, in uh, that part of the world. Now, it's worth raising the question and, and, and the reading will answer it. Why cities in the first place? Um, I don't think people were looking for more exciting nightlife. Cities were meant to meet very practical needs, uh, needs related to agriculture. So be looking for that as you read this week. Now, once you've got cities, and cities are becoming fairly populous. Uruk had something like 50,000 people. Um, that's going to give rise to further needs, um, specifically needs having to do with communication. Having that many people in one place puts certain barriers to communication. So that's really where writing comes in. Okay, so we now see uh, writing for the first time. We don't really get writing without cities. And you know, if you think, if you think about Milligan for a moment, you know, Milligan. If you add together, you know, all the students, all the faculty, all the administrators and staff, you know, you're going to have something like a little less than maybe than two thousand people. And so basically. Milligan's not really a city, it's more like a Neolithic village, but imagine trying to uh, make Milligan run without writing. If we did not have the ability to write things down, how difficult it would be to have this organized community that we're a part of. So I think that gives you some sense of, of why writing is going to be an almost necessary consequence of cities of this scale. And uh, the earliest form of writing that we know of in uh, this part of the world anyway, is known as cuneiform, which had thousands of characters. And uh, as you might imagine, just looking at this slide, that this would be a type of writing very difficult to learn, very difficult to learn even to read, certainly difficult to learn how to write. Uh, and so there was a, a kind of specialized elite who were able to do this. So don't imagine that when writing comes along, suddenly uh, everybody is doing it, everybody's reading, everybody's writing, that is far from the case. Now at first, and I've already hinted, writing is, at least in Mesopotamia, is going to meet very practical kinds of needs. But once it's established, it is then able to be applied to a bunch of other uses as well. And now is the time to alert you in case you haven't already looked at the essay question for this week. Uh, the essay question has to do with the, the development of writing and even more so the benefits the multiple benefits of writing. So you want to be thinking about that, particularly as you read West in the World. Okay, so just to kind of sum up what I was saying about civilization. When you hear the word civilization, I want you to think kind of automatically of two things. I want you to think of cities, and I want, to, I want you to think of writing. It's really hard to have cities without writing and without cities, you don't have civilization because city is 
built into the word civilization. Okay, in the remainder of my time in this video, I want to focus on Mesopotamian religion and I want to do so through art. Now, you're gonna be watching a lecture from Dr. Jackson on Mesopotamian religion, uh, and that's gonna be very important. He's going to focus more on some of our literary evidence for Mesopotamian religion. I'm gonna focus more on art and architecture and what it tells us about Mesopotamian civilization in general, but, but also what it tells us about Mesopotamian religion in particular. Uh, if I think if there's one kind of icon of ancient Mesopotamian civilization, it is the ziggurat. And here you see a ziggurat that is still standing in Ur, although it's certainly in disrepair. This is the Nana ziggurat, uh, named after the moon god Nana. This is fairly typical of ziggurats in that it has a kind of trapezoidal design. It has a, a number of staircases. You can kind of make out three here, staircases by which you would ascend. Now you can tell that uh, the top of this ziggurat is not in its original condition. And indeed at the top originally was a temple. So what you're looking at was basically just an elaborate base for the temple that would be at the top. And the temple would contain a statue of the god or goddess in whose honor the ziggurat was built. So, you know, what were ziggurats for then? Obviously they had a religious purpose, but let's be a little more specific than that. Um, for one thing, they were seen as a, a kind of meeting place between heaven and earth, right? So uh, a stairway quite literally to heaven. Um, so, um, a kind of uh, intermediate zone between heaven and earth. And then the temples at the top, again, would have these statues of, of the god or goddesses and um, the, the, the statues, well, you'll read about this in the Western world, the statues themselves were, were treated uh, almost as living embodiments uh, of the gods. So, you know, this is all a very elaborate way of honoring the gods. And um, I'll come back to this in just a moment. But one thing that we see in ancient Mesopotamian civilizations, and indeed almost all ancient religions, is the idea of religion as a kind of quid pro quo. Uh, I give you this, you give me that. So in this case, um, we build uh, an amazing temple, we uh, lavish care and attention on the statue of the God, and in return, the God will bless us with prosperity, security, fertility, um, again, both reproductive and agricultural, and so on. Uh, and we see this same basic dynamic in play uh, with the next slide, okay? So these are statues that have been excavated from the Abu Temple uh, in, in Tel Asmar, Mesopotamia. You can tell that they vary in size. The tallest one is about 30 inches tall. So these are not life-size. These are quite a bit smaller than that. Um, they're made of stone. And I think it's worth saying something from the jump about the variation in height between these figures. Uh, basically, these uh, hierarchical proportions, notice that's a term in your study guide, so you want to know that. Hierarchical proportions. What that means is the size of each statue sort of corresponds with the socioeconomic status of the person who commissioned it. And so what you would do is you would commission a statue to be made. Um, and the statue basically represents you, okay? Um, and notice that all these statues um, have very uh, wide eyes and uh, this sort of posture. 
And both were supposed to represent the awe and respect that the worshiper has in the presence of God, because these statues would be placed in the temple uh, to represent the kind of perpetual worship and adoration of the person before God. So even if you were out in the fields working or you were in the marketplace trading, um, in a way you were, were still worshiping um, the God. Now, uh, again, you would want to, to um, uh, commission the largest statue you could afford. And obviously, if you're not terribly well off, then it's going to be a smaller statue. If you are very wealthy, you can flaunt your wealth by commissioning, you know, that 30-inch figure that we see there. Um, so that's sort of what hierarchical proportions uh, is, is all about. It, it reflects um, social stratification, social hierarchy. And again, it reflects this kind of uh, quid pro quo idea that we see in ancient religion. So, um, I, you know, I'm paying good money to have this statue made of myself as a gesture of honor and respect. And in return, I expect security and prosperity and so on and so forth, or at least you hope that uh, the God will provide that for you. Uh, one last point I want to make about these is simply that, you know, we still see um, some of the artistic characteristics here that we saw in Paleolithic and Neolithic art, namely a kind of blend of abstract and representational elements. So you can clearly identify these as human figures immediately but the way that the beards are rendered, the way that the eyes are depicted, these are clearly not meant to be naturalistic. All right, well, let's uh, turn to another sculpture. This is a sculpture not of an ordinary person or even just you know, a wealthy person, uh, but of a, of a ruler, a ruler named Gudea. Now, one of the big points that Dr. Jackson is going to make in his lecture on Mesopotamian religion is the way in which religion and politics were intertwined, inextricably intertwined in ancient Mesopotamia, and how uh, religion could often be used to prop up sort of political propaganda. And I think we see that happening here. So this is a, um, a statue of the ruler Gudea made of diorite, which is a very expensive kind of material. And one of Gudea's great legacies was that he built a number of different temples in his, in his realm. He, he was the ruler of a, of a city-state, Lagash, L-A-G-A-S-H. And so he built these temples and he had statues of himself placed in each one. The, the, the one you're looking at, this is one of about 20 surviving statues that Gudea had commissioned. It's amazing that they've all been preserved or that all of those have been preserved. Um, so let's look at this for a moment. Um, again, we see the, the hand gesture, we see the large eyes. So we see that Gudea is um, sort of deferential um, and uh, respectful in the presence of the god. Remember, temples were seen as the abodes of the gods. So if you're in the temple, you're, you're in the presence of the gods. Uh, now, you'll notice that there is an inscription on his robe an inscription in uh, cuneiform. And basically what, what is being described here, you know, he's describing all of the temples he built for the gods. So he's kind of advertising his own piety, is advertising the fact that he is so devoted uh, to the gods. 
And this brings us to the, the way that Mesopotamian rulers saw themselves, the, the religious role that they assumed. Mesopotamian rulers were not viewed as gods, per se, but rather as special emissaries of the gods, intermediaries between the gods and human beings. Um, and so, um, if, you know, the king has a very important responsibility of maintaining good relations with the gods so that his people might prosper. So, in a way, when Gudea is advertising his piety and devotion to the gods, he's also styling himself as a great protector of his people, because that's how you, or at least one way you protect your people, is by maintaining those good relations with the gods. This is a point that we're going to see in our final slide as well, and that is the famous Hammurabi steel. Um, steel is also a study guide term. It's sometimes people say stele, I say steel. Um, but basically, steel is a vertical stone monument, usually inscribed with text and or image. And of course, here it's and, right? We have text that is uh, cuneiform, you see there kind of in that middle band of the steel, and then the image above it. Now, this is a very famous law code. It's not famous because it's the first ever written law code. It's not. But as you can tell, it's in great shape. It has been really well preserved. It's in the Louvre, by the way, in case you're ever in Paris. Uh, it's about seven feet tall. And um, it, you know the, the law code itself is of great interest and significance. But I want to focus on the image at the top. Uh, what we see there is an image of Hammurabi, the king, who is on the left, receiving a scepter, um, or, or re actually receiving the law code itself from the god Shamash, that's S-H-A-M-A-S-H, -S Shamash, on the right. And I've got a close-up of that, okay? Um, so it, it, again, it's showing Shamash giving Hammurabi the, the very law code that is inscribed on the steel of Hammurabi. Um, he's also giving him a ring, which I think you can probably make out as well. And so, of course, what is the message? The message is not, well, everybody should obey these laws because Hammurabi came up with them. Uh, no, he is um, simply uh, transmitting divine laws. Now, again, he's the specially appointed divine intermediary. Um, and, but that's precisely why his law code should be honored and observed, okay? Not because, you know, Hammurabi's a clever guy with some really good ideas, but because he has this special intimate relationship with the divine. So again, in contrast to what we'll see in ancient Egypt this week, the king is not passing himself off as divine, uh, but rather, is positioning himself as uh, a special ambassador of the gods. All right, see you soon.